Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session on historical context and student voice. Uh, I am your host, Jamie Adams, uh, Arizona Affiliate National History Day Coordinator, and I am joined today by Allison Avery, who is the Central Arizona Regional Coordinator. That always feels like it's got too many words in it. I feel like I'm going to miss one. Okay. So today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about historical context and student voice as we're thinking about putting the final touches on our research and thinking about drafting our history day projects. So what is historical context? Uh, so historical context is the larger setting in which your topic takes place. Uh, it's all the stuff that's happening around the person, event, or a place that you're studying. And that all has a direct impact on how your topic plays out, how a person thinks, how a place exists, all of that stuff. So in order to understand why things happen the way that they do, it's very important that we understand historical context. History does not happen in a vacuum. And context is key for understanding why things happen the way that they did or why they happened at all. So a question that I always like to my, ask myself is, okay, well, why is this happening now? Now, meaning the time period that I'm studying. Why is this happening now and not 10 years in the past or 10 years in the future, for example? And that can very readily be answered by the historical context. So when trying to figure out the historical context of an event, here are some questions that you can explore. So how did this event happen? When did this event happen? And why did this event happen? All three of those questions are really related to the historical context of an event. But historical context is not just anything that's happening around your topic, right? It needs to be related. And not only does it need to be related, you need to articulate the relationship between those things. It's really important that you don't assume that your audience understands what you're talking about that you don't assume that your audience has the same knowledge base that you do. It's very important that you successfully argue the connections between things. So here's a good example of that. So let's say we're looking at the debate over the Equal Rights Amendment in the 60s and 70s. Um, so related to that debate, the, historic, the necessary historical context for understanding what's going on there is the Vietnam War, women's liberation, the sexual liberation movement, and the states' rights movement. Those are all happening at the same time. But you know what else is happening at the same time? The rise of disco. Um, so I think it would be fabulous if you could relate the rise of disco to the debate over the Equal Rights Amendment. But that's not an obvious historical context. That's one where you'd have to really make a compelling argument for why those things go together. Um, so that one might be a little bit more difficult to connect um, unless, of course, you're using the rise of disco as evidence of counterculture and the relating counterculture to women's liberation, um, for example. So it's always really important that we pick the best, most representative evidence, but that we're not purposefully leaving things out that contradict our point. Um, it's a really fine balance to walk. It's incredibly difficult balance to learn. And it will take some trial and error for you to figure it out, but I'm fully confident that you will. So in addition to the fact that you need historical context to contextualize your topic, right? Contextualize to put into context. You also need historical context to understand primary sources. Um, so if you're looking at, say, the Plessy v. Ferguson case, you need to understand the historical context that surrounds that specific moment in time. Why did the, 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 why did the Supreme Court justices make that decision? Um, what kinds of precedent were they playing on? What was American culture like at the time when that decision was made? And how does that influence that decision? Um, I think that we sometimes think that particularly um, justice is blind, right? I'm sure that's a, a saying that you've heard before, but all people are influenced by their environment. Historical context is getting to the root of that influence and understanding how that environment does influence people. So remember to acclimate when you're looking at primary sources. What's happening at the time that the source was written that might have shaped it? 
And then another important question that you could consider is what is happening at the time that you are reading the source that might shape the way that you've interpreted it? So how does, say, living in a post-Berlin wall, a post-communist society, uh, affect the way that you would read a primary source, for example? Um, and if you need help analyzing primary sources or you're like, I don't know what acclimate is, clearly it's an acronym because she's capitalized and italicized the word, but I don't know what that means. Um, check out our workshop recordings on our YouTube playlist or under the Students tab on the NHDAZ website. And we've got a workshop that looks at a bunch of different strategies for analyzing different kinds of primary sources. Okay, so if you're filling out your roadmap at home, the secret code word for today's session is Nogales. And this is actually, I believe, the last uh the last workshop that has a secret code word so if you're following along at home and you're competing in national history day this year and you're filling out your roadmap you have until december 1st to send your completed roadmap to the national history day in arizona email address that's nhdaz at azhs.gov and we'll give you a special treat at the state award ceremony okay so changing gears a little bit what is student voice? Student voice is you. <laughs> uh, you are the expert on your topic, and so you need to speak clear. Uh, you need to speak, you know, write, uh, perform, edit clearly and authoritatively. We, the judges, uh, me, your teachers, everyone who's participating, every adult who's participating in History Day that's looking at your project. We want to hear your ideas, your argument, your supporting analysis. So your project should be distinct from, but inspired by your research. And that's also a very difficult line to walk. So remember that there is a difference between using sources to further your argument and just pointing at source material. It's very important that you find a way to take expert opinions on a matter, or primary sources and find a way to put them in your own words so that your voice comes across very clearly. Um, I don't care what Dr. So-and-so had to say about this topic. I care what you had to say about this topic. Okay, that's all well and good, but how do I actually do that? Um, it's really important that you balance appeal to authority, which is important part, which is an important part of proving your expertise, right? Remember, in the past, I've said that history is not about facts and figures, it's about interpretation, and it's about experts having a conversation with each other, theorizing different ways of why the past happened the way that it did, right? That's history. So you do need to balance that appeal to authority with just quoting an expert just to quote an expert. Um, so I think that papers and exhibits um and websites to a certain extent very much fall prey to this where you'll just kind of slap a quote on your project and call it good don't do that <laughs> as a matter of fact there was some debate at the national level between um folks at national history day and then all of the state coordinators as to whether or not we would actually permit students to use quotes um so just keep in mind that quotations and including quotations is not always the best way to prove your point. So I want you to think about this question when you're thinking about including a quote in your project. Um, does this quote include language that I think is absolutely necessary to understanding what this expert is saying, or can I say it differently? One of the skills of the historian is to learn how to paraphrase and to learn how to summarize. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but um, a lot of us are really learning how to put things in our own words. That's paraphrasing, that's summarizing. Okay, so one of the easiest ways to make your voice clear is to not lean too hard on the, worlds of, uh, the words of others, particularly from secondary sources. So I want you to challenge yourself to remove all quotations that aren't from primary sources, and even if you are including quotations from primary sources, choose very, very, very wisely. Translate the words of the expert into your own words, paraphrase, but remember to cite. 
it is incredibly important that if you summarize or paraphrase an expert, you need to cite them. Otherwise, that's plagiarism, and we will flag you for cheating, even if it is accidental. Um, and don't freak out about that. If you do accidentally plagiarize, we can fix it, but we need to catch it before you progress to the national level, um, because the judges at nationals will not be as kind. So remember, if you paraphrase, if you summarize, if you use a direct quote, you need to cite. So I've got an example here, and this is an example from Dr. Laura Key's article in the Journal of Arizona History about Mexican-American service during the Second World War. And so I want to think about this little passage and think about how we could include this in our project. So it says here, Martin contended that Mexican-Americans bore the brunt of the draft, Mar Martin's contention, pardon me, that Mexican-Americans bore the brunt of the draft was not unfounded. Nationwide, an estimated 400,000 Mexican-Americans served in World War II, overwhelmingly in frontline combat positions and in dis disappropriate, wow, disproportionately high numbers when compared to other racial or ethnic groups in both combat and enlistments. Okay, so we could just quote that in our project. We could just take that quote, throw it on our exhibit board. We're not going to do that. We're going to paraphrase. Because when we paraphrase, it proves that not only did I understand the passage that I read, but I can successfully relate it to my argument. And of course, because I was inspired by the work of someone else, I'm going to cite them. So that's why we paraphrase. That's why we try to avoid quotation marks. And that's why student voice is super, super important in your project, because I want to know what you think. I don't want to know, I, I'm fully confident that you can read and understand the source material you're looking at. What I want to know is what you think of it. And that's why student voice is so, so important. Uh, I would also encourage you to take a look at the rubric and make sure that you understand what's being asked of you in each of your respective categories of participation, right? So um, that's an important kind of hack moving forward is to read the rubric. I want you to read the rubric, print it out, mark it up, make it make sense to you, whatever you need to do, um, because that will help you understand the difference between an exemplary project and a novice project. Um, and we want to make sure that we're moving up in levels, that we're sharpening our skills as a historian, and we're not backsliding. Um, so it's key to understanding how to move from one level to the next. And it's also important to understand what the judges are looking for. Um, just because I, I think sometimes there's a little confusion when I tell students that I'm not looking for a report, I'm looking for an argument. Um, so a report is just a list of facts, basically. And an argument explores what do those facts mean? And if you have a compelling argument, you are already going to have big components of your own unique voice within your argument. And that's what we're looking for. Okay, so that is pretty much it for our workshop series this year. Uh, there's going to be the category specific workshops on November the 20th. So that's the weekend before Thanksgiving. Um, so we're asking students to register for those workshops. And I'm gonna linger here for a second so everyone has an opportunity to uh, jot down this URL. Unfortunately, we couldn't get it any shorter than this. Um, so if you need help understanding the rules for your specific category, or let's say you're changing categories, um, maybe you wanna try performance this year, whatever, um, you can join us for the category specific workshop on November 20th at 2 p.m. When you register, I will send you meeting information, um, if there are not a ton of kids that register, we'll have a big group meeting. If there are a lot of kids that register, we'll break it up into the different categories and um, each category will have a different time slot that you'll show up for. Um, but I will send you all of that information in the weeks to come, but you need to register for this workshop. And with that, uh, that is it for the 2021-2022 student workshops. Um, like I said, if you missed one, you want to review one, whatever the case may be, 
All of the workshops are on the Arizona Historical Society YouTube page in their own playlist. They're also all on the uh, National History Day in Arizona website under the Students tab. And so that you can find, and I'll actually show you how you can find that really quick, just to make sure everyone knows. So you can find that by navigating to the Arizona Historical Society website, and then you go to this tab that says Education, click National History Day in Arizona, and then you click Students. And it's got all of the workshops, and it also has all of the new rubrics for the 2022 contest. And we're gonna have a meeting mm, later in January or early February to talk about the new rubrics and what they mean and how to read them. Um, and as always, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Um, you can email us at nhdaz at azhs.gov. Bye everyone, take care.